very much, Hannah. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, my name is Johannes Greubel. I'm a senior policy analyst at the European Policy Center, and they're also um, project lead of our Connecting Europe project, which brings together civil society organization across Europe, uh, giving them the platform in Brussels, um, and also working on, um, yeah, more broadly, bringing together policymakers, um, think tankers, and civil society on a range of topics and in a range of formats. <clears throat> I have the pleasure today to uh, um, give some uh, um, insights on the European Parliament election, which is a topic that we at the European Policy Center um, yeah, work on uh, in quite uh, big detail. Of course, uh, the European Parliament elections also for us as a think tank is a big um, event um, in the political calendar um, where we, we as well can have um, a lot of impact. So the, the parliament elections are very crucial also for us. And we are, um, I'm also involved in, in many activities that we do at the European Policy Center in, in that context. <clears throat> I um, yeah, want to give some introductions on the European parliament elections, first on, on the context, then uh, on the elections themselves, um, what they mean. So I'll present a few projections, a few polls. Um, and then of course, discuss also what this, what the result itself, but also the whole political political process around the elections will mean or might have as an impact for uh, the future of the of the European Union of of the next five years. <clears throat> but let me first start with uh, maybe the political context. I um, outlined here four um, yeah categories, uh, four points, um, which are which I thought are important to mention when starting such a. Um, such a webinar, um, the context um, that we all live in and why it is important um, to uh, vote in these elections and uh, in general, why these elections are important. First, um, the EU is currently in a, in a PERMA crisis. Um, a PERMA crisis, as my colleagues at the EPC coined it some time ago, um, they argued that uh, Europe is in an age of PERMA crisis, so multiple um, often interrelated crises that um, have become the new normal at the European um, Union level, starting with the financial crisis in 2008, um, but of course then also Eurozone crisis, migration, um, terrorism, uh, COVID-19, and, and uh, recently Russia's war in Ukraine, and of course the war in, in Middle East. So rather than being an exception, PERMA crisis has become new normal, the new environment in which Europe operates and also will continue to operate. And that will also necessitate a change um, in our political thinking and particularly impact the um, election context, but also the, the years after that. Second, uh, we're currently in, in a poly transition of our societies in the middle of a green and digital transition, uh, which uh, yeah have been uh, heavily impacted already the commission program and the EU's program of the last five years, but also in the middle of economic demographic transition, uh, which all will um, uh, yeah continue in in the next years to come. Third, um, a, a, an additional um, political context or important context to give is um, that we're currently in a in a super election year. So not only do we have European Parliament elections, which will reshape European decision making, European priorities. But uh, 2024 is notable for a large uh, number of elections. I think it's uh, more than half of the world's population that will head to the poll in the course of this year, um, including, of course, in Europe uh, on several levels, on the European level, uh, several national levels, but also regional levels in the months to come. And of course, also um, the US election that provide a a political context for um, for this year, and then um, fourth, um, the uh, yeah national developments, um, a stronger right, uh, far right, uh, stronger populist forces in many member states. If you just look at polls in uh, Germany, in France, um, but also many other countries uh, on the national level, but also regional level. If you look at Portugal, most recently, for example, but not only in polls, also uh, in government. Um, representation, these forces are on the rise and will impact how European politics will, will look like in, in the future. And then that brings us to uh, um, the European Parliament elections themselves. Maybe for a start, just a few 
um, uh, yeah, key facts, uh, very general facts, very basic facts about um, the parliament elections. First on the parliament, of course, the, the European parliament is the world's only directly elected uh, transnational assembly and as such is a key actor in EU policymaking. Um, the European parliament is has a central um, a role in giving EU legislation. It's an EU uh, co-legislator together with the Council, with member state. Um, they shape, they uh, vote on all EU legislation that is adopted on the, uh, nearly all EU legislation that is adopted on the European level. Uh, but it is also, of course, um, a control body and um, yeah, a, a representative body for uh, <clears throat> uh, Europeans uh, with uh, 720 seats. Um, the first election after Brexit, um, so we will have um, a, a growing parliament from 705 seats at the moment to uh, 720 seats um, in, uh, um, yeah, in, in the new election, uh, where each member state uh, will be represented with a number of MEPs between six um, in Malta, Luxembourg, Cyprus, and uh, 96 in Germany um, under degressive uh, proportion proportionality. But I think what is important to mention is that MEPs don't gather in uh, national groups, but rather in transnational political groups, um, according to or following uh, European parties. So um, this is also what you see there on, on the picture on the, on the right, uh, the hemicycle where MEPs sit um, separated in um, political groups, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, not national groups. On the elections themselves, um, as Hannah already um, outlined, we're nearly, uh, or we are, we're now um, uh, one month ahead of the European Parliament election, will, which will take place uh, between the 6th and the 9th of June, depending on the member state, um, where citizens from all member states elect their MEPs for the next five years. Uh, we do have a propor proportional ele electoral system at the European le level but um, with national specifications um, uh, and um, yeah, national lists in, in all parties. And that's why also the, uh, uh, the election time uh, varies between the 6th and the 9th of June, depending on uh, national uh, considerations. Uh, but less than 400 Europeans will be eligible uh, to vote. Um, but um, yeah, for the first time, and that is a novelty, uh, 16th and 70 year old Europeans in several member states, including Austria, Belgium, um, Germany, uh, Malta and Greece, uh, where only 70 year olds can vote, um, will be heading to the polls. So uh, making more space uh, for young vo uh, voters in uh, these elections. Um, <clears throat> and that brings us already with these uh, general facts um, to the projections, what can we expect from the European um, elections before looking at um, a possible um, yeah, grouping or, or a possible projection of the hemicycle uh, or the political group strength. Um, I wanted to start with some good and bad news and particularly when looking at um, the, uh, the title of today's webinar talking about Euroscepticism, I also wanted to uh, um, uh, highlight some good news or some, some good signs. Um, and I think um, to uh, um, uh, points, uh, data points, uh, could point uh, to a yeah, positive outlook. First of all, according to a um, recent Eurobarometer, 60% uh, of European uh, Europeans are interested in the European elections, um, which is a considerable rise from uh, compared to 49% ahead of the last elections. Of course, it needs to be seen how this can translate in a voter turnout, um, and that will also um, uh, yeah, heavily depend on voter mobilization in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but uh, just the fact um, that European um, Europeans are, first of all, interested um, is, is, I think, a good sign, particularly when you, know, when you look at the jump uh, in comparison to, to the 2019 numbers. And um, the second point is that there is potential um, for high youth participation. Um, as mentioned, 16 and 17 year olds in several member states are um, allowed to vote, opening a new electorate, um, and uh, that also following uh, the 2019 election results, where a, a very high youth turnout has already um, resulted in an increase of the uh, overall voter turnout. I think that is 
also a um, a good sign um, if uh, certain criteria are met. Uh, but that brings us already uh, to the bad news. Um, so far, um, there have been not many signs of, of uh, any political mobilization. Of course, there have been party congresses. Um, there has been a debate in Maastricht, but in terms of general mobilization, mobilization um, general um, profiles, uh, general uh, political discussions around the elections, uh, not much uh, can be seen so far. Of course, we we are still thanks. Um, we are still uh, uh, a month before the elections, um, but still um, there is a lot uh, to be done um, ahead of the of the elections. Uh, second. Um, and just very briefly, because I mentioned it already, the far uh, the rise of the far right, um, and of course um, that will also um, highly likely um, result in the more fragmented European Parliament um, for uh, the next five years. And with that, uh, that's the, the perfect uh, cue for um, looking at the next slide, um, looking at uh, some yeah projections. Um, this is how the European Parliament uh, looks like um, at the moment with, with different uh, political groups, um, uh, with, with a grand coalition, if you might call it like this. Um, in the European Parliament, there is no uh, formal coalition, but um, there is a de facto a grand coalition of um, yeah, uh, from, from the Greens um, over the Social Democrats, um, the Liberals uh, to the EPP, which currently holds uh, 490 seats, so 69% of um, of um, the the seats, and a um, right block with um, around 18%, 127 seats. Uh, if you look at the Conservatives and Reformists, and and at the uh, idea, um, so the far right um, uh, corner, um, the yeah, the the darker blue and the really dark blue on on the slide here. Um, so this is um, how things are at the moment, and this is why um, how current polls look like for um, for the new European Parliament. And what you can uh, see there already is um, that if you look at um, the Grand Coalition, um, if you might call them like this, um, that there is a considerable uh, weaker Grand Coalition with thirty five uh, seats. Uh, um, yeah, uh, loss, uh, particularly when it comes to green and and liberal uh, forces. Uh, but we, what you can also see is um, that there is a considerably stronger uh, far right block um, with uh, yeah more than forty votes um, uh, for more than forty MEPs um, in addition to the current um, state of play. Um, uh, of course, that all will depend um, also on the group formation, which will take place after the votes, um, and particularly for um, the, the far right block that is um, not certain how the final groups will look like, and there might also be a, um, uh, yeah, a potential for reshuffling um, of these um, uh, far right groups or of the far right uh, group um, formation, particularly as the far right is um, a, a very incoherent group um, usually, so there might be changes as well. That, um, but uh, what might definitely uh, come to to the groups that that are currently shown is uh, Fidesz, um, the Hungarians, um, that will join either the ECR or the ID uh, group. Um, so um, what we what we can see is. Um, uh, yeah, that there is a weaker grand coalition, that there is a strength in far right, but at the same time, that um, there is still a, a majority of the um, yeah uh, of the grand coalition of the centrist and leftist forces um, uh, as as things uh, stand at the moment. Um, but of course, um, uh, uh, it it all depends um, on uh, the the political process um, that will follow afterwards. So there is the potential uh, not only for um, the, the far right groups to be st strengthened, but also uh, the potential for a possible EPP uh, and ECR uh, pact. Um, uh, so uh, uh, yeah, a, a rightish uh, pact um, or right pact in, in, in the parliament. Um, so uh, in that sense, um, the real threat is not so much the result itself, the strength of the um, far right itself, 
but uh, the willingness of uh, particularly the EPP to interact um, with, with these forces. Um, so what the, will that mean? Um, what uh, will that mean for the EP? What will the stronger far right uh, result mean for the European Parliament, for the European Union? Um, a clear answer here is um, it depends very much. Um, it depends on, um, first of all, uh, it seems very, uh, very basic, but it depends on the final outcome. Here, um, it, if you look at the group picture again, um, the final results, uh, in particular, the strengths of um, the political groups um, are very close. Um, so details matter there. Um, uh, every single vote and every single uh, MEP seat will matter. 1% um, up and down, one seat up and down. Um, one, um, yeah, projection uh, more or less, or one point, uh, one or less in projections uh, compared to the projections can make a difference. Uh, can make a difference, and the difference will really be if the ID or ECR uh, groups um, will become a third, lar third largest group in the European Parliament, which will have a considerable impact, not only on speaking time, but also um, on the positions that these groups would be entitled to in, um, uh, yeah, in the presidency, in uh, um, yeah, um, in in uh, particular uh, groupings of of the European Parliament, um, it will depend uh, not only uh, sorry one slide back please um, it will depend um, not only on um, the the final outcome but also and I mentioned that already on the level of co collaboration um, and cooperation that the far right will receive. From other political groups, um, as mentioned, there is the potential for a pact between the European People's Party and um, the Conservatives and, and Reformists. Um, so as, um, as I mentioned already, um, the real threat is not just the result itself, but uh, the willingness of uh, these groups to interact um, with, with these parties. And thirdly, um, what is... Um, uh, Finally, also contingent is the role that uh, these groups will um, assume in the, no in the new parliament. Currently, um, and there is a very interesting um, analysis of my colleague Corinna Stratulat, um, who uh, um, found out by looking at all the voting records of, of the current uh, European parliament, um, that the far right are currently the least influence, uh, influential groups in the European parliament due to their own behavior. Um, uh, particularly the, the ID group um, is um, the group that is least influential with least interactions with legislative files with least amendments uh, put forward. There's hardly any engagement with, with legislative works for that, so that um, the role um, in the future will also depend on how they will behave um, in the future. But certainly it will have an impact on the public discourse, not only in the parliament, but um, uh, more generally, we will see more populism, more politicization, um, it, of course, in addition to the potential impact on the legislative work itself. And um, uh, we might also see a general trend that uh, a strengthened far right will also uh, impact the positions of uh, other parties, especially the EPP, um, which we can already see on, um, on so many national levels. Um, very, very briefly, um, to close, I just wanted to, to make the point that uh, the European Parliament elections are so much more than uh, just the parliamentary elections as it triggers a whole uh, process of reshuffling of um, uh, a new leadership, of new priorities for the next five years, um, uh, kicking off um, the, the process of um, electing a new commission president, electing a new um, uh, European Council president, electing um, a new parliament president, but of course uh, with the commission president, a whole new college, uh, college of commissioners um, and a new high representative. Um, and uh, with that come also um, new priorities, new political priorities. Um, we will see a new uh, commission program, a new commission priorities, but also a new European Council strategic agenda. So if you look at the months ahead, um, I would argue that the really interesting stuff, and uh, next slide here, please, um, the really inter interesting stuff will um, also happen after the European Parliament elections, which uh, when really the political process of 
um, um, of uh, selecting the new leadership, but also uh, negotiating the new priorities uh, will take shape, uh, particularly when the European gr uh, Parliament groups are being formed, when the European Council in June will um, uh, nominate their uh, nominee for um, the, the European Commission president and um, following um, the constituent plenary session of the European Parliament, we will see probably a summer full of political ne negotiations between political groups in the Parliament and um, the, the new Commission um, before the new Commission president will be elected in, the se uh, in September and uh, take office in um, the, the, the months later. So um, particularly the summer will be a very um, full summer, full of political negotiations that really will shape how we will go into uh, the next couple of months and years, of course, uh, in the next couple of five years. Um, <clears throat> so um, when it comes to scenarios, that will also be my, my final message. Um, when it comes to potential scenarios, for the next um, coming year, uh, we will, I'm afraid, need a bit more patience than just the 10th of June. After the European elections, we would know, know not exactly what the results will mean for the priorities, because the puzzle, the leadership puzzle, the priority puzzle is much more complex. Um, and in fact, that's when um, the really interesting um, discussions will um, start. But um, we we will already have um, a grasp of the new priorities and uh, first indications of uh, the new uh, priorities that we can see already now because there's different discussions already ongoing, particularly in the European Council. Um, the European Council is, is currently uh, debating its new strategic ag agenda, which will then also impact the new Commission program. And I think uh, here we can already see uh, um, a few trends that I want to close with. Um, first, um, on, on topics, uh, we will uh, likely see a program that will be shaped by uh, the war in Ukraine and not so much more shaped by the green and digital transition as, we see, as we've seen it um, in the past. You can already see that in the draft document for the strategic agenda, but also um, when looking at discussions about a potential um, defense commissioner, we will see that competitiveness will be a very high on the agenda, both of the strategic um, um, agenda of the European Council and the Commission. Um, we've seen uh, several reports, letter report, Draghi reports uh, on competitiveness um, in the past. Um, we've seen, unfortunately, that the Green Deal um, is already re relegated as a subtopic um, in the context of competitive competitiveness that we can already see in the uh, in the strategic agenda document, and um, uh, yes, uh, but but more broadly, we will probably have to uh, uh, wait a few more months to see what will um, uh, what will happen, um, and of course, it will also depend on on how uh, the European People's Party um, engages with the ECR um, group. Um, if if it does, we will probably even see less climate change and more anti-immigration agenda. Um, uh, less um, yeah, rule of law, fundamental rights uh, focus than we have it um, at the moment. Um, but um, and expect um, in general, uh, uh, following the result, uh, more polar polarization um, on EU decision making, not only to, due to the stronger rights, uh, but also uh, due to the other uh, political um, uh, forces. Um, I'll leave it at here. Uh, sorry for being a bit longer than than initially expected, but uh, looking forward to uh, to a discussion later on. Thank you so much, Johannes. I think this is uh, really helpful in terms of setting the ground of where we are and where we're going. Indeed, um, I'm also very grateful that you have uh, also shared a few positive messages because, indeed, at the moment, um, I think media is full with negative speculations. But um, as you rightly pointed, there is still time to influence the outcomes and there's still time to engage throughout the process that comes after the elections. I want to note also, Joe, uh, thank you so much for sharing indeed the leaked council strategic agenda where there's so much mention of defense. It's uh, it's a bit shocking even uh, compared to last time indeed. 
Um, Joe is also one of our leading members in the Democracy Thematic Network, and we wanted to give um, our members working in that constellation also the opportunity to share what they are doing. Um, unfortunately, our colleague leading on this, Niels, couldn't join today uh, due to last minute um, prioritization, but I'm very happy that uh, Hannah Zurmatz will bring forward some of the key elements from this uh, group of foundations working on democracy within our filia membership. So over to you, Hannah. Uh, thank you so much, Hannah, and thank you, Johannes, for outlining indeed uh, the the scenario, also what what we might be expecting um, after the elections. And uh, indeed, foundations um, are engaging around the EU elections. However, they um, are traditionally have traditionally been a bit hesitant to engage in political activities. And there, um, the the clear boundaries, I would say, they could stem in from their own statutes, from the law. Sometimes the legislative uh, regime is um, is prohibitive in terms of in, in foundations engaging in political activities. Sometimes it's also uh, their own, um, yeah, of course, mission, strategic decision, or they might be, um, yeah, also um, just simply careful and afraid, potentially also of some perceptions of their neutral position that they uh, would like to claim. So um, we have seen that um, it's a great diversity of how foundations engage nonetheless around political activities and the EU elections. And in this um, the webinar, it's of course impossible to outline the entire uh, scope of what they do. But what we um, are aware of is that uh, several and many foundations are supporting general democratic health, voter behavior, voter education, or also work around voter turnout, accessibility of elections, debates, citizens' engagements. So this is something where foundations um, feel quite safe and quite a number of them engage around that. Uh, we also see that there have been foundations uh, that have now uh, really developed the sense of now or never, they need to, we need to get more actively engaged. So what they are doing is that they are more actively supporting organizations and movements with watchdog functions, or uh, those that wish to push for electoral reforms or uh, minority um, representation support and um, and also um, campaigns or supporting organizations that um, campaign around uh, increasing the voter turnout. So this is just a snapshot of what foundations are doing. Um, and uh, generally, um, they are not actively um, engaging in party politicals or supporting individual politicians political parties or political campaigns, but um, there are a couple who are also doing that. Um, now, I wanted to also highlight uh, just a, a few cases of what um, um, our members are doing. And here, um, one example is the Onta Foundation, a Spanish foundation, who wants to mobilize participation of people with disabilities in the EU elections. And they have launched a campaign in this regard. And there is a video, uh, the link is here in the, in the presentation. We can also share it in the chat. So please watch it uh, and are encouraged to also share it. Then um, there is also the, the Evans Foundations and Hack Belgium Labs who have um, collaborated or joined forces um, uh, around the Hack for Votes. Uh, and that is to explore creative solutions around uh, voting and elections. It's um, to challenge, to address challenges of how to use AI um, and next generations to mobilize young people to vote um, and how to um, show better impact of, for example, the European climate policy, good or bad, has had uh, and how that could um, inspire young people to vote. Then um, a third um, example I wanted to highlight here is Europe Talks. It's a project of the European Culture Foundation Partners and uh, that wants to kind of match citizens of different political spectrums into a conversation, which is then facilitated by some journalists and really bring them together into a conversation to uh, to enable new conversations and, and ideally also some, some bridging that could be done in that regard. Um, we, we then also have, as Hannah outlined, um, at, um, at Filia, the Democracy Network, which is a very active network and has been even more active now also ahead of the EU elections. There was um, a lunch organized by the Democracy Network also around the elections, and that created definitely a sense of urgency that the anti-democratic forces are gaining influence and that, that there is a, th a true threat to our European core values, such as democracy, rule of law and fundamental rights. 
and uh, they shared the last polling information and 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 hence uh, the future scenario thinking there uh, is been also um, mobilizing more foundations to be um, activated around this agenda. So what they did is that they shared strategies for safeguarding democracy during the elections and beyond. And one particular initiative is uh, that these foundations um, decided to create a list of potential funding targets. So they collected some uh, more than 50 plus projects uh, which are active around the elections where foundations have indicated that additional funding could have a real impact. Um, and this was then circulated and spread and, um, and uh, among several networks of Philea. And uh, we have then taken no active coordination role in that, but we invited foundations to choose then projects among those 50 plus projects um, that align with their own strategies to support those. And already more than 300K have been put forward towards the targets on this list. So that's been some of the some of the work that the, the democracy uh, network of Philia have been um, yeah, activating. Yeah, thank you so much, Hannah. And one of the key contributors to this uh, initial funding of the projects on the white or the whitelist, so-called, has also been European Cultural Foundation. And I'm very happy to now um, also welcome Sylvia to present in these the, the Democracy Resilience Edition of the Culture of Solidarity Funds. Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, I will just kick off. I'm being mindful of the time, uh, and I will kick off with a statement. Uh, strengthening the European cultural solidarity is essential in countering polarization and growing feelings of being left behind. This was the main drive in, for ECF to set up the cultural solidarity fund as a rapid response mechanism. Since its inception in 2020, it has worked with pooled funds from more than 20 philanthropic and public partners and has provided flexible support to a growing range of cultural emergency situations starting from the global pandemic to the uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine, more recently the climate emergency, and now, and this of course is uh, linking to the conversation we're having today, the strengthening of the resilience of European democracies, particularly ahead of the European parliamentary elections. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, moving to this particular edition of the fund, the Democracy Resilience Fund, uh, it was launched in uh, early this year, uh, together in collaboration with uh, Avens Foundation and Allianz Foundation, and I take this opportunity to actually uh, give a shout out to Joe and Alban uh, from Evans and Allianz, so it's lovely that all three of us, three partners, are actually here uh, taking part in this conversation. Uh, we started off with two sort of starting points uh, in mind. Uh, one is actually uh, that what we saw that throughout Europe, uh, there are numerous creative initiatives with a strong track record in defending democratic engagement at local, regional, national, and European level. But many of them are, and many of them are actually ready and eager to double down their efforts um, ahead of the European elections. However, we also saw that many of these lack the resources necessary to do so, so essentially to increase their reach and impact in this crucial year. And the second point, and this of course does not need much contextualization, we've already had that uh, in the beginning of this uh, webinar, time is of essence and the stakes are high, and there's no need for me to elaborate on that further, we all know the reasons for that. However, this is relevant for us uh, as donors uh, in a sense that it's leading us to the conclusion or the realization that this is not the time for experimentation or um, uh, trial and error. So uh, this led us to, these lines of thoughts uh, led us to the following approach or methodology when it comes to uh, this edition, uh, Democracy Resilience Edition. We uh, decided to uh, focus on um, already operating initiatives or well-established organizations that either have been part of our broader network, and this of course is a nice bridge to the list, or as we call them internally, the white list uh, that Hannah just mentioned before, or have been identified through in-depth research, um, internal research by us or our partners. So basically, to put it differently, we did not work with open calls this time, which was a departure from previous editions of the fund. This turned out to be, or we consider this to be an adequate choice 
under the circumstances because it did allow us to maximize our efficiency and impact of the support of our support within a relatively limited window of opportunity. Um, and this is maybe a good moment to connect back to the list again uh, that Hannah already mentioned and sort of clarify the relationship between the two. So our work was very much intertwined with this list and not only, of course, because um, uh, one of the co-founders of the Democracy Resilience Avens Foundation was also one of the initiators of this list. But essentially, uh, the fund, uh, having joined forces with uh, Alliance and Ravens, uh, both uh, con were contributors to this list, but also heavily drew uh, from it when identifying, scouting, identifying and assessing uh, initiatives, individual initiatives for support. And I would like to make one uh, remark here as well, which is more relevant from ECF's uh, side. So for ECF as a foundation with European purpose, uh, this work very much falls within the heart of our mission and that uh, any anti-European turn at the elections would substantially affect our um, existence, not necessarily financially, but when it comes to our mission and vision. So this is why for the first time actually in ECF's history, which is a relatively long one, some of you probably might know, an executive decision was made to make additional resources available from our reserves to uh, add, uh, to allocate for this purpose, to allocate um, for, um, to the Democracy Resilience Edition. Um, and finally, before moving to the last part, uh, a couple of facts and figures, and just to mention a couple of examples, unfortunately, I won't be able to give you a full uh, introduction to the initiatives. I'd love to, uh, but there's no time for that. Um, but just to give you a couple of uh, uh, tidbits. Uh, so since March, we have scouted and selected 28 European initiatives for booster support uh, in the total amount of uh, just over 500,000 euros. Mm, and these include some established and well-known players in the field, such as the Good Lobby, the European Youth Parliament, We Move Europe. I'm sure many of you have also uh, considered these for funding, but also some smaller and younger initiatives, for instance, uh, Palumba. Uh, Palumba's voting advice specifically advice app specifically targeting uh, first-time voters, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, has just been launched uh, last week. Um, and also, maybe just from the other spectrum, other end of the spectrum, uh, an interactive theater play by a Marseille-based organization, Le Tête de l'Art, which uh, takes Europe, which is where Europe is brought to the stand in the form of a mock trial with uh, in front of a youth audience. Uh, for the full list, I very much encourage you to go to the website. Um, they are constantly, it's constantly being uh, updated with um, the selected initiatives. And finally, uh, I was asked to share a couple of learnings, a bit of a disclaimer. As you can tell, this is a very young initiative. We've only um, started three, three, three and a half months ago. Obviously, the projects are ongoing, um, very much in full swing. Uh, we don't yet have a lot of data, and of course, we're yet to receive uh, evaluation reports. <clears throat> but I collected a couple of um, initial impressions that are hopefully relevant um, uh, to some of you, or you can relate to them. Uh, first is would be, of course, we had to act swiftly. And time, there was a lot of time pressure uh, around this work. Uh, but I do believe that this we we managed to to tackle relatively successfully through the very flexible approach uh, with our partners uh, when it came to designing the processes and also the quite light administrative and reporting requirements imposed on our uh, grantees. And all of this allowed us to act relatively swiftly. I cannot overestimate the added value of acting in coalition as donors and the advantages of pooling not only resources but also brains and networks essentially and maybe just to make this claim a bit more tangible I can give you a um, rather subjective uh, example um, myself uh, but for instance uh, the very solid data and polling and research via initiatives that were supported previously by Evans and to which we actually had access to um, during the selection process was invaluable in assessing the different uh, campaign initiatives 
and singling out those where uh, strong branding and strong presentation was also backed by substantial groundwork. Um, or another um, uh, example, reflection from Allianz's point of view, for instance, is that Allianz took an individual rather targeted deep dive in specific geographic um, uh, localities um, in its internal research, and they focused their research on the German and Polish scene. And the insights from this uh, field research was very much um, uh, allowing us to have well substantiated decisions when deciding on the initiatives to, to support from within these contexts. Um, and of course, it goes without saying that acting in collaboration also made our case much stronger internally when we were actually organizing or well, you could say lobbying for additional resources to be released uh, for the purpose of the fund. And then finally, and this I'm sure it seems self-evident, especially in this group, but I think it cannot be said often enough that the fight for democracy is a long-term effort and it goes much further than these last few months of high season uh, campaigning for uh, high season. So, of course, this has a lot of layers and potential uh, threats for discussion for the philanthropic sector, but focusing on this particular case, um, what's relevant for us is that uh, this is why we already started looking ahead and we're looking further uh, or beyond uh, the 9th of June and have already started planning further actions, further open calls for after the elections. And I guess uh, this group is really the adequate space for me to take the opportunity to invite you all to join forces and to, to pull together resources, expertise, and, and knowledge, and align on this very important work on democracy. I will leave it at that, and obviously uh, very happy to answer any questions uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia, indeed, for being so uh, concise and also to the point and for ending with a very clear call to action. Indeed, there is still time to engage, um, which is also my takeaway from Johanna's uh, intervention before. So thank you for echoing that. Um, without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Hannah to also come in with a call to action and to <clears throat> show us how now we can actually concretely engage even before and also, of course, beyond the election. So over to you, Hannah. Thank you. And it was really interesting to hear also the, the collective efforts and the joining of forces of, of our members and the foundations around this important topic. And what is clear is that um, the EU elections are always and have always been a moment for us to engage with the policymakers. It's an opportunity to stimulate interest for philanthropy and the role that our sector can play in moving different um, European agendas and important societal issues. But of course, having seen the polls, having seen the, the considerations, it's particularly um, important because we know that we cannot take our space for granted. And we see that we might, uh, given the, the polling, that we might also have less friends in the EU institutions with regard uh, to philanthropy and our policy us. Hence, that's why um, we come in with our um, Philea Manifesto, which we hope that many of you have seen um, at this very moment, because we see that the situation for our inspector, and that's something that our mapping that we do as Philea has clearly shown that the 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 space for civil society and the space for philanthropy um, cannot be taken for granted. So we see that we are still struggling also with a lot of barriers. We do not yet have a single market for for public good, and quite the opposite. We even seen that there are further restrictions introduced on our sector, and there is a there is a fear that this might even. Uh, increase after the election. So we see that there is an issue with the recognition of le legal personality across borders. We sense that foundations have issues when they want to move their seat across border, when they want to merge across border. That's something that companies can do, but our sector cannot. We see that there's still discrimination going on with regard to um, tax law. Um, giving across border is still hampered, and there's a lot of current engagement around this topic also. We've seen that member states and also at EU and international level have introduced new, new um, red tape, more registration, more reporting rules on our sector. And uh, um, a final also very worrying development is the fact that um, at national level, we see that there's foreign funding laws and restrictions introduced. That's a trend that it, we observe uh, with great concern. And we also see that at EU level, there's also the idea around the defense of democracy 
package to also introduce a directive on uh, addressing covered foreign interference. And there is concern that this would also impact on the, for, on the fund, foreign funding on the CSO sector in, in Europe. Uh, we also have seen that uh, at national level, there have been some restrictions put on political activities or political engagement of foundations. And that's something that we also observe with concern. Um, then our members have also reported that uh, they have more difficulties in um, transferring funds across borders. So the banks are not offering service to our sector. And that has to do um, with the agenda of money laundering and terrorism uh, financing um, policy, uh, because policy that intends to um, fight these crimes um, has um, an unintended consequence, namely that the banks are considering our sector at high risk and they are not offering the services to our sector. So all of these barriers have led to also self-censorship within our sector. And um, we have hence come up with our um, FILEA um, manifesto with four key steps to introduce what we call a single market for public or for a single market for philanthropy. We call on policymakers to empower philanthropy, to create an enabling space for philanthropy, to facilitate cross-border philanthropy, and um, to engage with philanthropy. We need a better dialogue with policymakers, and we hope that we can set up a good dialogue with the new policymakers once they're in place. And um, the fourth recommendation is really to partner with philanthropy, to also consider us as co-grantors and uh, co-investors, and to provide better tools to do this and to potentially adapt the financial rules also in this regard. We have already received um, quite a lot in the last decade uh, and the political <laughs> um, arena. We have um, the council recommendations on fundamental rights, which were approved in 2022. Uh, the Social Economy Action Plan, which was approved also at the end of 2022, and the Council recommendations for Social Economy um, approved end of last year. And that is something where we sense there's the real recognition of the role of our sector. And there is a call to action also to remove barriers to cross-border philanthropy um, and also a call to action to consider collaborating and to provide a better toolbox for our foundations to also do impact investing and co-investing also with, with public um, public budgets. So there is a lot of move there. And I, of course, also want to mention uh, the efforts around the European Cross-Border Association, uh, which is a legal form that uh, will potentially be introduced. And we would like to, of course, also see that efforts will then be continued to also develop a, a new legislative initiative around foundations. So there is a call to action now um, and we are working already now um, with our manifesto. Um, we want co-ownership by the sector and we're also reaching out to policymakers with our manifesto. Uh, so the call on you also to join our efforts here to become ambassadors and support the agenda. And following the European um, elections, we also, of course, want to reach out to the new policymakers and uh, with our four key recommendations. And um, we also want to support our national members and our national networks in particular to design uh, an enabling framework also at the national level. And here, just to mention one example, uh, the Irish government has recently um, agreed on a strategy around philanthropy um, to promote philanthropy at the national level, where we've also been collaborating and contributing to this strategy. So we really hope that the EU election can also be um, uh, a hook uh, and a multiplayer for our call to an enabling environment for philanthropy, but in a context of wider civil society. So we are also joining forces with the wider civil society around a full-fledged campaign around uh, uh, a call for a European civil society strategy. So we believe the, me the momentum is now, we need better dialogue with the policymakers. And here you can see on our timeline of how um, we want to engage and we are engaging with the policymakers around this agenda. Uh, and um, as I said, we are doing that together with partners and counting on you all to also have this in mind when you reach out to policymakers um, ahead and after the elections to be aware of that we also need to make an effort as a sector to uh, defend and promote um, our own space because that will be important for us to be able to continue the work we're doing. Finally, uh, you will see that the, the full year is, 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 um, um, is set with different events, but draw your attention to December 3rd, which will be the moment of our um, Europhilanthropics event in Brussels, where we want to meet the new policymakers and be invited already and block that date in your calendar. 
And then back over to you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Hannah, and thank you to everyone for indeed sharing your thoughts. Uh, I think there's a lot of information that we have been sharing. Um, maybe I can ask you, Hannah, to uh, stop sharing your screen so that we can see each other, of, uh, or at least those who have our cameras on. Um, and I really want to welcome any questions that might come or any comments you want to make. I didn't see any in the chat, but I would invite you to raise your hand with the function or to really just unmute yourself since we're um, a, a nice group here. Um, I will give you a few seconds. And otherwise, I have my own questions, of course, but I'm really eager to hear if anything comes up from, from you, from our audience. Joe, I'm really happy to see that you have put your hand up, of course. Let us hear what you have in mind. Thank you. Well, I did, yes, I didn't think I was going to be able to make this call, but um, I cancelled a bunch of meetings because my daughter kept me up all night. So um, so it's just a technical... Hey, Ioannis, um, nice to see you again. Um, just a technical question on where you're getting your data from, um, because most of the polls that I see have ID consistently four or five seats ahead of Renew. Yet yeah, Eurograph, uh, I think, was sort of renew on eighty six and ID on eighty two because I, I totally agree with you that the the, the most important well, one of the big important questions, but certainly one of the most variable questions that's going to come up and what we can do something about between now and four weeks is is that third place because uh, it's on a it's on a knife edge. Um, so I'm just interested where your data is uh, coming from, and and then the sort of real question behind that is. Do you think that polling is systematically undercounting the support for ID? Um, or do you have relative faith in that we've learned our lessons from Trumps and Brexits and various other things and are not adequately accounting for um for 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 people who are gonna vote right wing and speak to posters? Um, thanks, Joe. Um, uh, for for your questions, um, I think there is there is still the danger that um, uh, the the polling is slightly undercutting um, the the right forces um, uh, under representation of of these numbers. Although I think we've uh, we've become better in that uh, recently, but I still see the um, the danger that this uh, is the case. Um, uh, just to say uh, on on the sourcing, um, my numbers were from. Uh, Euronews, the most recent polls from from Euronews, um, uh, um, and I think um, the, there is there is a number of um, reasons why um, there there can be uh, um, discrepancies. First, um, it matters whether you are you have a, a European wide poll or if it's a, a poll of polls, uh, basically. And second, I think a second um, consideration is uh, the group formation that political editors already um, uh, make when uh, when putting that uh, down together these these numbers uh, as mentioned there's a lot a uh, lot of um or uh, fluctuancy uh, or, or reshuffling of these coalitions possible when it comes to certain uh, right-wing parties um staying independent uh, joining id uh, joining um uh, ecr uh, particularly also when it comes to uh, fidesz so um this is um i guess uh, or this is probably how it can be explained that um there there is the discrepancies in the seed projections um, but but it is it is a close a very close call right um, when it comes to particular the third place um, in um, uh, in the election results. Thank you, Hannes. Uh, Joe, I hope this answers your question. And uh, of course, we know still a lot can be changed, hopefully. So let's see how things evolve. I don't see any additional questions. We have three minutes left. So uh, with three speakers, this, well, now two minutes left, um, this maybe gives you, each of you, the chance to share any additional considerations that you have also having listened to your colleagues today. So maybe I'll hand it over to uh, Sylvia first, and then let's see if uh, Johannes and Hannah have other thoughts to share. I'll hand over the opportunity first to my two colleagues. Sure. Okay. Well, maybe since we've heard from Johannes just now, Hannah, over to you. Yes. Well, I think the the call is on all of us. Uh, it's still um, some weeks to go. So let's let's see to mobilize. Let's talk about let's talk about the issues we care about, 
and let's make sure that the, we, uh, we as citizens, but also we as philanthropy, as foundations, do our utmost to mobilize people to, to join uh, the elections and care about the issues we stand for. Democracy, rule of law, fundamental rights, um, the green uh, and uh, digital and social transitions, they are, they, are, they are so important developments and we don't want uh, the process to, to lose on speed. So, so let's all mobilize and let's make sure that everybody cares and everybody goes to vote. And that's that's it. I hand over to to Johannes then. <laughs> I think that is that is very nice uh, closing remarks. Maybe uh, and and I fully agree. Uh, maybe one um, additional um, thought that that I might want to bring in. Um, I think Hannah um, has summarized it quite well when uh, when when she said uh, out of uh, several contributions there is. Uh, one of the lessons is that there is still time, but I think um, uh, there is also need to engage, not only uh, before the elections, as, as Hannah mentioned, but uh, particularly also not uh, after that, uh, when it comes to uh, formulating pro political priorities, engaging with policymakers, which is uh, crucial, especially this time around, as we will not only have a full reshuffle of, of EU leadership, but also... Um, expect to have uh, quite a turnover in the parliament. Um, um, uh, over half of, of MEPs um, will probably uh, be changing. So um, there is the need to engage with policymakers also after the elections to uh, make new alliances and make sure that uh, our priorities still um, are valid and are, are taken out also after the elections. Thank you, Johanna. Sylvia, one final thought? Um, we're also running out of time, so no pressure at all. Um, maybe just bringing it back to the very concrete brand making work. Um, I would just like to give you a, a short, like personal um, uh, reflection. Uh, I went to visit one of the initiatives that we supported, our Rule of Law Academy, uh, which is a peer to peer student uh, uh, based um, uh, foundation, actually based in the Netherlands. A couple of uh, law students uh, organized a boot camp for um, undergraduate students to come together and strategize and come up with communication uh, strategies, how to mobilize first time voters across Europe. And honestly speaking, this has been one of the most rewarding professional experiences of my last 12 years. And it's been wonderfully refreshing to uh, converse, to, uh, to communicate and to brainstorm together with this 19, 20 year old and see the creative potential that these kids have. And I actually came, uh, left that event actually much more cheerful and much more hopeful for our future. And I encourage you to engage with these creative initiatives, not only because of our, you know, the convictions of our organizations, but also personally to find to re, re, reinstall the inspiration and drive, we often sometimes feel a bit lacking in our work and somehow, you know, to, it disappears through the great daily grind. But there's a lot of satisfaction and fulfillment and joy and hope that you can actually get from engaging with these initiatives as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for ending us on a note of joy and hope indeed. And with that, I wish you all a very nice lunch break.